Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. My name is Dr. Sarah Mackey from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Here at Lawrence Livermore, data science has become an essential discipline in many of our key program areas. LLNL is home to many challenging data sets, as well as home to some of the world's most advanced supercomputers. Our data science staff work in a variety of areas, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, statistical inference, predictive modeling, and uncertainty quantification. The Data Science Institute acts as a central hub for our lab's data science activities. We host events like this seminar series in order to introduce new ideas and potential collaborations to our laboratory staff. We invite speakers from outside the laboratory, from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative approaches with our data science community. We are pleased now to include a wider audience in our seminar series through these recordings. You can read about past speakers at our website at data-science.llnl.gov or you can email us at datascience at llnl.gov. Thank you and enjoy the seminar series. You can imagine that if you're running a simulation uh, like the one shown here, I think it paused, but um, you would need some kind of function that's telling you how to move the atoms as you're propagating forward in time. And that's exactly what the interatomic potential does, where uh, it takes as input the atomic environments and it gives as output the energies of those environments and the forces on those atoms. That way, as you step forward in time, you know how, how they're moving. So when I'm talking about interpretability with respect to these simulations or these models, um, I mean trying to make it so that um, in these models, it's as easy as possible to identify and isolate different physical phenomena um, and that you're able to trust the models uh, and therefore the simulations that you're running with those models. Now, as you're going forward designing these types of models that you're uh, running these simulations with, I think there's a few questions that you should be trying to ask yourself and answer about your models. Um, and obviously, those are the questions that I was trying to answer over the course of my research, and I'll be using them kind of as a rough outline for today's presentation. Uh, first, I think you should be thinking about what size of models you need to be working with. Uh, you don't want them to be so large that you can't understand what they're doing, but you also don't want them to be so small that they're not able to faithfully reproduce the physics from quantum mechanics. Next, you also want to make sure that your models make it possible to do analyses across different types of systems. So you want them, if you're trying to learn any fundamental physics, uh, you would want to be drawing those conclusions um, from a lot of different systems at the same time. So you need to make sure that your models not only work on for many different systems, uh, but also kind of facilitate and make it easier to do these cross system analyses. And finally, it's important to think about when you can trust your model. Uh, so understanding that if you're running some kind of simulation using a model, um, are you sampling any environments where your model might not be able to make good predictions? Because then the physics that you're seeing from those simulations might not actually be real. Just to help get us all kind of on the same page, uh, since I know that there's kind of varied backgrounds in this group, um, I've given here a diagram demonstrating how we're going from our inputs, which are the atomic structures, so Cartesian coordinates of atoms inside of a box, to the output, which is the energy of that system. Um, in this field, there's kind of thought of as being two different types of models, uh, where in both cases, you start off with your atomic configurations, you extract the local environments around each atom, and then you pass them through a model. Um, in one case, the classical potentials, those models are relatively small, so they only have very few numbers of parameters. Uh, and those parameters are uh, directly tied to physical quantities. So these classical atomic potentials are often very interpretable because of their size and because of the fact that every aspect of them um, has some kind of physical meaning to it. The other type of model, which I'll just call with the umbrella term of deep learning interatomic potentials, um, again, starts off with those configurations, extracts local environments, um, but then first builds some kind of descriptor, so some representation of the local environments that can then be passed through a deep learning model. 
Uh, so in the simplest case, this could, descriptor could just be a vector representation constructed from the atomic environment, and the deep learning model could be a vanilla feed forward, forward neural network. The key difference here is that now these deep learning models are much, much bigger. There's thousands of parameters now rather than just maybe 10. Um, and none of those parameters have any physical meaning to them. Uh, so they're, they're much more difficult to uh, interpret and understand why they're doing what they're doing. The specific classical model, so this smaller class of model that I'll be talking about in today's discussion, um, is what's called a meme potential which stands for Modified Embedded Atom Method Potential. Um, so this is an extremely popular potential form uh, that's been used widely throughout the field for many years now. Um, and it represents the potential energy of the system as the summation between a pair term uh, and an embedding term, where the embedding term is supposed to represent the energy cost of embedding an atom into a given electron density. And that ele electron density is further decomposed into a, a two body and a three body term. Um, now, the analytical meme, which has been used so widely, has explicit um, equations for each term in this function. Um, so the phi, rho, u, f, and g would all have uh, you know, analytical equations for them. The difference in the model that I'll be talking about is that instead of these equations, we'll be using cubic splines. So for this model, there will be five different cubic splines instead of those analytical equations. The idea being that it would theoretically make the model more flexible um, at the expense of some loss of interpretability, because now the parameters of the spline, which is the position of the spline knots, now again no longer directly corresponds to physical quantities. I think what's more useful, a more useful way of thinking about this model, um, instead of looking at those equations, is to just use this diagram here where you're starting off with the local environment around an atom, uh, and then you're prop propagating that environment through your model in order to output an energy. Um, and as it's passing through this model, it's being transformed by these cubic splines and then summed together into, into the energy. The reason I think it's useful to draw the model in this way is because it has some very obvious parallels um, to um, what many people would be recognized as a, just a neural network structure. Um, so in the diagram on the right here, I'm showing a depiction of a neural network based potential NNP, um, where you again start off with your uh, local environment. You create some vector representation just so that they can be passed through the neural network, and then you're again propagating that representation through the model until it turns into an energy. Um, these models are very similar in that, you know, as you're going through, as you're moving deeper through the model, uh, you're transforming your representation in different ways, um, but they're different in first that the spline-based mean potential is using cubic splines for these transformations rather than fully connected layers in a neural network. Um, and second, that in the neural network, you can uh, expand the width and depth of your network as much as you want in order to increase the fitting capacity. Um, but because of the way that spline meme is defined, you're restricted to only having these five splines connected in these ways. There are some obvious advantages to using these deep learning potentials, which is why they become so popular in the field nowadays. Um, one of the biggest things is that with these use of descriptors, you can achieve very fine resolution, uh, spatial resolution, uh, when you're describing the local environments around an atom, which means that these models can be better at distinguishing between different environments. Um, for example, the way that this could work, one example of a descriptor for a deep learning potential um, is where they take multiple shifted Gaussians that span their domain of interest, in this case, uh, the, the range of pair distances between two atoms, um, and they evaluate each Gaussian for every element um, within that local environment to create one component of the descriptor. So they could increase the number of these Gaussians as much as, possible, as, much as they wanted, uh, and therefore increasing the size of their descriptor and getting that very fine grain resolution. The other big advantage is that with the more complex mapping functions, since you're so flexible um, in the functions that you can approximate with a neural network, uh, you can achieve much better, fun you can make much better function approximators, and therefore uh, it should be able to do better mappings from your descriptor space into an energy space. 
Uh, these come at some obvious disadvantages, though. First, that the use of these larger descriptors uh, means that you're evaluating many, many more functions, and therefore they're much more they're much slower to run simulations with. Um, the other big thing that I've already mentioned multiple times now is that these complex mapping functions um, can be a lot harder to interpret um, compared to like a classical model. Uh, for example, here's the architecture of one. Um, existing deep learning potential, uh, where it's just a four layer neural network, which to many people who deep who do deep learning would easily say that this is actually a pretty small model. But when you compare it to something like the spline based mean potential, which has, you know, maybe tens of parameters, uh, it's significantly bigger. So then if we ask a question, just yes, please. before we go on, so, um. Can you, maybe I missed it, but can you say what's exactly the input? So your, your, your illustrations just say, oh, the local neighborhood, but are you always, you're using the X, Y, Z coordinate of a fixed number of atoms or the X, Y, the, the polar coordinates of your K nearest neighbor or what, what is it? Yeah. Because I would assume your model needs a fixed number of inputs, right? So, so what are those inputs? That's a great question. Yeah, and I think it's important to clarify exactly what that is. Um, so you start off with Cartesian coordinates. So let's say you have n atoms, so you have n three-dimensional vectors. Um, when you're extracting those local environments, um, the input kind of depends upon your model. Um, in the in the case of the classical potential that I shown here, uh, the inputs that you would get within each local environment is just pair distances. So you would look at every single at the atom, the center atom, and its distance to all of its neighbors within the, within a cutoff, and evaluate some function for all of those distances. So in the classical case, your distances could just be pair distances between two points. Um, in more complex classical models, which take three body interactions into account. Um, the inputs could include uh, pair distances as well as angles between triplets of atoms. Um, and those are usually, that's kind of usually the extent of what most models use is some combination of um, distances to neighbors and angles between neighbors. But just, just for me to make sure that I understand, but that really means that your potential is not a potential in the neighborhood, but the neighborhood is made up of, like in your, the, the image here, you've got four neighbors. But you're not actually fitting a function of four neighboring atoms. You're just you're just saying these are four pairwise potential in the classical sense, or maybe at most like three different triplets of neighbors. So the, yeah, the, so the actual potential I'm fitting is always either pairwise or triplet if I want to make things complicated. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, for example, what you would do is you're trying to take this central atom and predict the force on that atom. Um, so you would have some function that takes these four distances into account, outputs an energy, and then you would take the derivative to be the forces, and that's how you would do your training process, um, is, is fitting through those energies and forces. Okay, and then I also fit a separate model for each type of atom, right, if they're different. That's, they're that's a really it. good point, yes. So if you have aluminum versus copper versus whatever, um, each one time it's a different model, or if you have a binary system, um, it's, you could think of it as three different models or just one model with kind of three different channels um, where one of them is for your AA interactions, one for AB and one for BB. Um, so yes, it does depend upon the chemistries as well. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a really important clarifying question, so thank you. Um, yes. So then if we go back to these, these questions I laid out earlier of how big of a model do I need to be working with, one way you could start to analyze that is by doing a direct comparison between this classical spline-based mean potential um, and some of the deep learning ones. Uh, so that's exactly what we did. Um, sorry, I'm trying to move around some of the like WebEx controls here because they're blocking stuff. Um, so we took six single element data sets from the literature. So um, this means that we were building six different models, one for each element type. Um, these data sets were hand constructed by the authors to be intended to contain very diverse sets of atomic environments. Um, so they would have things like uh, ground state structures, but also things like snapshots from simulations, defected configurations, and surfaces. Um, with the idea, the hope being 
that they would be diverse enough to be good benchmarking data sets. Uh, the result was that they had data sets that was usually 200, 300, 200 to 300 structures. So they had 200 to 300 uh, DFT computed energies that they were fitting to, uh, and then maybe 10,000 to 30,000 atoms comprising those structures, uh, meaning that there was 30,000 target forces that they were fitting to. Um, the authors of this, these data sets originally used them to benchmark these five deep learning potentials, uh, but they've been used since then to benchmark uh, many other deep learning models that have been, been, been developed in the meantime. Um, I won't go into too many details about the differences of, between these models because I don't think we necessarily need to concern ourselves with them too much about that in this talk. Um, it's sufficient just to think about them as under that umbrella of deep learning potentials. Um, I also want to point out that as we're moving forward, I'll be showing a lot of results that include results for these five models, but this is not my work. This is stuff that was generated by the original authors of these data sets. So when you take each of these models and fit them to these data sets and compare them relative to, to each other, um, these are the errors that you get out. Uh, so on the left-hand side, these are the errors in reproducing DFT energies, and on the right-hand side, the error in reproducing the DFT forces. Uh, when you see these graphs, a couple of things can immediately jump out. First, it's clear that the spline-based mean potentials aren't state-of-the-art. Um, they're not competing with the, the very best of the deep learning potentials, uh, which is reasonable. They are significantly smaller, um, and they have different ways of representing the environments. Um, but the other important thing that is that even though they're not state-of-the-art, they're still kind of in that ballpark of performance um, relative to some of the other deep learning models. Um, so this is important to see that, like, despite the big discrepancy in the sizes of these models, uh, the, the de performance disparity isn't actually that big. Um, this is also interesting for people who develop these models because um, usually classical potentials are thought of as being significantly worse than deep learning potentials. Um, so people could expect the errors shown here to be even one or two orders of magnitudes bigger than they are. Um, so this is good to show to kind of dispel that belief a little bit. Perhaps more important than just fitting to those energies and forces is checking how well the models can produce, can predict material properties. Uh, so what we're seeing here is for the six data sets and the six models that were fit to each of those data sets, their property predictions on a subset of properties normalized relative to the DFT values. So a model that's perfect um, on these graphs would look graphs would look like a regular heptagon with its vertices at one. Um, so the things to notice here are that the spline-based mean potentials, again in black, um, are performing just as well as any of the machine learning ones on all the data sets, and even better than them in some of the other ones for certain properties. Uh, Josh, just I have a question uh, or more a comment. Hmm? Uh, when you assess errors on these these training sets, uh, the training sets were were they all like centered around ambient? proper, uh, you know, conditions for all these elements, or are they including some kind of transferability across volume and pressure and, th and things like that? So um, the properties that are shown here um, are all relatively basic, so they, they may not necessarily be transferable pull across, you know, very large um, uh, pressures or volumes, but there are other tests that you can perform that do kind of check how well it goes. Um, um, in how well expands to different sets of environments. Um, so things like where you're checking stacking fault energy curves or energy versus volume curves will assess that transferability to these higher volumes. Um, I think I saw a question in the chat, but it disappeared before I could read it. Yeah, I can get that for you. Um, so I think the question is about the origin of the data that you're that that you're analyzing, and the question is if you're training the models on simulation data. So, um, in a way, yes, you're training it to simulation data, but the simulations are from a lower level of theory. Um, so, you know, I was talking about how there are different levels of theory here, and I'm working at the atomic scale, but you can also use electronic structure calculations to run simulations. Uh, the difference is that these lower level theories will take actual quantum mechanics into account. Um, whereas the models that we're fitting are just trying to approximate the effects of the quantum mechanics. Um, so the input data is coming from quantum mechanics simulations. 
Um, so I did see that message. So I am training the spline based mean potential, but the authors of these data sets trained all of these five, which are all deep learning ones. So I'm only able to take credit for this top row here, um, but all of these data sets were trained, or all of these models were trained to the same data. Thanks for those questions. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, the thing I was saying here is just that, you know, kind of building up on that, upon that fact that these lower complexity models are able to perform reasonably well uh, on these given benchmarking data sets. Another thing that makes the spline based meme models particularly attractive is their speed. Uh, since they're so much smaller, they're less computationally intensive, so you can run molecular dynamics faster with them. Um, so what we're seeing here in these plots on the y axis is a testing set error. And on the X axis is an estimate of the computational cost of running a simulation with these models. Um, where the circles on the graphs are different hyperparameter choices for each model and the stars on the graphs represent the optimal potential that was chosen for each type of model um, based on its prop predictions of material properties. Um, the dashed line is kind of sketching out the empirical Pareto front in this space. So points that are falling on these dashed lines represent models that are theoretically optimal in terms of speed um, and accuracy. Um, so the things to pick out here are that, uh, again, although the spline-based mean models are higher up on this graph than some of the deep learning ones, especially because of its speed and the fact that that vertical gap isn't too big means that they're still kind of dominating portion, a portion of this Pareto front. Um, along with one of the machine learning potentials here on the high cost, um, high accuracy region. Another important attribute of these uh, models, which you know, has, I've been motivating in this talk, is the importance is the ability to start to interpret the, what the model is doing. Um, so especially since this model is so small um, and it lends itself to nice visualization, um, it makes it a little bit more easy to interpret. Uh, so you can just directly plot each of the splines that make up the model in order to start to recognize patterns and how it's operating. Um, so you can see simple things like the fact that one of these splines has learned to be nearly linear, so it's simplified the model even further than is shown here. Um, and you can recognize familiar patterns like uh, uh, for material science scientists, uh, a Leonard Jones-like structure in the pair potential term. Um, so this fact that it's smaller and the fact that it lends itself to visualization uh, uh, makes it a lot easier to, to try to understand what the model's doing. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, because of how this model was structured, you can regularize the model even further in useful and meaningful ways. Uh, for example, you can add a term in the loss function that um, discourages uh, the, that penalizes the curvature of the splines in order to encourage simpler and smoother models. Um, and you can pin different knots, uh, for example, forcing the pair potential terms to go to zero as you increase distance. That way the total energy of the model would tend to go towards zero um, at increasing separ separation of atoms. Despite this, you know, we were seeing that they have reasonably good accuracy. Um, they are noticeably faster than some of the deep learning models, um, and they have nice ways of being visualized and understood. There were still kind of some red flags to us when you, we were fitting these models to these data sets. Um, notably, you may have seen that in the Pareto plots I showed earlier, um, there was sometimes cases where the optimal potential uh, was actually one with higher errors. Um, what this could mean is that the model is lacking the flexibility necessary to fit to all of the data at the same time. So it's seeing a trade-off where in order, in order to um, get good material property predictions, it's having to allow for higher errors on some of the structures in the data set. Um, so that's an indicator that it's, it's not a big enough model. So we wanted to test this the spline-based mean model on bigger, more challenging data sets. The data set that we chose to use was an aluminum data set generated by a group at Los Alamos National Lab um, who uses a technique that will construct very large and very diverse data sets. Um, so they use an active learning technique for generating their data sets where they will generate a training data set, fit a model to that data set, run a simulation with that model, 
and then check to see if any of the environments that it sampled during that during that simulation um, had high uncertainty according to their model. And if it had an high uncertainty, it would add it back into the training data, rerun DFT on all of that data, and then retrain the model. Um, and in this case, the, they were generating an uncertainty by uh, an ensemble metric where they'd train a bunch of models and check the variance in their predictions. Um, so this resulted in a data set that had over 6,000 structures, so over 6,000 different energies that were fitting to you, and over 800,000 different atoms, so 800,000 forces that are being trained to. Um, and this makes it about 30 times larger than any of the previous data sets I talked about previously. Um, but not only that, not only is it does it have more structures, it's also much more complex. Um, so this data set was originally used to build a model for shock simulations. Um, and over the course of the development of this data set and the testing of this model, they showed that the data set included extremely high energy environments, um, the types of things that would just be way further outside of the training set than what was seen in um, the, the, the other benchmarking data sets I talked about. Uh, and when you fit the spline-based mean model to this data set, it's immediately apparent that it's not able to handle the data. Um, there was portions of the data set where it could get reasonably low uh, force errors, so it could fit to the forces reasonably well. Um, but there was a large portion of the data set where it just couldn't train to that data. Um, so it was very clear when fitting the spline-based mean model to this more complex data set um, that it just didn't have the capacity that it needed. So that gives kind of a partial answer to that question of um, how big yeah, of models. Yeah, yeah, Josh, that's that Sebastian again. That that's why I was asking about volume changes and the potential. That's exactly yep. why. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, that's that's a big problem with those previous data sets I talked about. Um, is that even though it seems like you know they're you know in the papers that talks about them, it seems like they're pretty diverse. Um, they're not big enough to be good benchmarking data sets. Um, so. They're actually pretty popular in the field, and if any of you build models and use those data sets, you should kind of take it with a grain of salt because I think they're actually too small. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the question then is, if the spline-based mean model can't handle this data set, how can we change it? How can we make it bigger so that it can? Um, and again, we can go back to the, di the diagram that I had of it to start to give us an answer, um, because this diagram very obviously leads you towards the idea that if I want to increase the capacity of this, um, maybe an easy thing to do would just to be to replace part of this architecture with something like a neural network. Um, so that's what we did, and we'll be calling that architecture a spline-based neural network potential, where you're taking the cubic splines from the spline-based mean potential, and instead of just summing them down together, you're instead passing them the outputs of those splines through a neural network. Uh, a convenient way to think about these is now considering the splines as just like convolution filters that you're applying to the local environment around an atom in order to generate a signal that gets passed through the model. Um, now that we're using a neural network, the similarities to a neural network potential um, are very clear. Um, where really the only difference between the existing neural network potentials and this proposed spline-based neural network potential is in this first layer, where normally uh, in the neural network potential, you're using a fully connected layer, so you can get um, complex interactions between each component of this descriptor. But in the case of spline-based neural network potential, it basically equates to using um, a non-fully connected uh, layer, where only portions of the nodes uh, connect to specific outputs. Um, so the way that I think about these two models relative to each other is that the spline-based neural network potential is just a neural network potential with some additional regularization on the first layer. Um, and that's, I think, a good way to think about it moving forward. When you fit this spline-based neural network potential to the larger data set, it, it seems like it's pushed past the limitations of the spline-based mean model uh, and is now able to reasonably well fit to this data. Um, so the error magnitudes that I was showing on the previous side were things like um, 0.3 on the good portion of the data set and like 1.4 on the bad portion. Uh, so this is fitting much, much better than the spline-based meme to the entire data set. Um, it's also extremely valuable that 
although it's you know taken on some architecture that looks more is more like a neural network potential uh, it's still significantly smaller um, this is the exact architecture of the model that was used to generate this data where there were eight convolution filters so eight spline filters that were used in that first layer uh, and then four layers with relatively few numbers of nodes in them um, so we're looking at maybe a few hundred parameters now um, when you compare this to uh, the original network that was trained for this data um, which had about 15 to 16,000 parameters. Um, it seems like a stark difference, but you're obviously also going to see a trade-off in accuracy where the original neural network potential, so the one that doesn't have that, that extra regularization on the layer, is able to achieve errors that are three to four times um, smaller. Um, so I am using a smaller model. Um, it's still not going to be state-of-the-art, though. So then the question becomes that it, why would you use this model? We've made it more complex than a spline-based meme, but it's still not as accurate as a neural network. Um, and uh, the motivation for using it would be if the spline-based neural network potential um, is interpretable enough to warrant the loss in accuracy relative to a vanilla neural network potential. Uh, so one of the best ways to start interpreting this spline-based model is to visualize those spline filters or those convolution filters that it's applying to, to the local environments. Um, and we'll be using uh, polar plots that look like this. Um, so these, I guess that the model has eight different spline filters. So these are visualizations of each of those eight filters. Uh, and the way that you can interpret these models, they're, so they're polar plots. So um, towards the right is the zero degrees direction. Um, you can imagine that there's an atom at the origin of each of these plots. And then for visualing, visualizing two body terms, um, the color intensity of, these, of each plot represents the amount of signal that comes through when you place an atom at the given distance uh, along uh, in these plots. For So for the two body plots, you have an atom in the center and you have an atom at each position in the plot. Um, for three body interactions, it's similar, um, but you have one atom in the center. You have one atom somewhere along um, this x-axis, so the, the horizontal axis here. And then the signal that's coming through is the, is the uh, sensitivity of the filter to placing an atom, the third atom um, in that given position uh, in the plot. Uh, and then you're summing over all of the possible di distances of that second atom that was placed on the horizontal axis. Um, so the key points here are just that in these plots, the color intensity of the plot represents the amount of signal coming through the filter um, when an atom is at that given position. Um, and then red corresponds to, uh, in this case, a high positive value and blue is negative values. Uh, what you can do, so this, these are interesting on their own because you can start to understand how your model is interacting with the environments that it's seeing. Um, so you can see that they're particularly sensitive to this certain uh, region of angles. Um, and then there's, there's kind of these spikes here at this, these specific angles. Um, so when you're using a, a model like this, you would be able to run your simulations and check on how these filters are working with your system in order to understand what specific structures are leading to the physics that you're seeing. Um, you can also take these filters and propagate them all the way down through your network in order to output an actual energy. Um, so these top plots up here are just the, the filter sensitivities, but down here, they're actual energies. Um, um, and you again start to see some very interesting stuff where you can recognize low energy uh, uh, bond angles. Where's the, I'm sorry, maybe I missed something, but where's the angle coming from? Because the input to the system is just distance, right? So um, the ones I'm showing here are actually three body interactions. Oh. Um, so the angle is the angle between the, the three points. Yeah, so actually all of these plots happen to be three body interactions um, just because I chose for this model to only have three body interactions because um, they also cover two body interactions, but yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I think again, that's taking another step along answering the question of how big do the models need to be? Um, Spline-based meme is too small. 
uh, but the these spline neural network potentials kind of overcome that barrier while have still having good ways of, of interpreting them. The next question to look at um, is how can we make these models work for many different systems? That way we can start to learn these cross system um, or physics that applies across the different systems. Um, so you can imagine, um, I think someone was asking a question about this earlier, is like if you're building a model for different systems, you'd want to be able to understand how those models are relating relative to each other. The problem is that if you trained one to a given system and then to a different system, um, there's no reason that you would expect these two models to behave in a similar manner. Um, now, this is an obvious application where transfer learning could come um, could help us a lot, where if we take the spline filters that were used for one model and then reused them in the other model and then just train retrained the lower levels of the network, um, we get into a case where now we have kind of this common reference point from which we can start to, to analyze these potentials. Um, so you're using the exact same spline filters. So the first latent space that they're generating is the exact same space. So you can start to examine that space and the how the models operate in that space to know how they operate relative to each other. Um, in order to help appreciate the benefits of this, um, I'll show first, this is a visualization of that latent space. So I've taken all of the local environments in the aluminum data set, data set processed them with the convolution, the spline convolutions, um, and then plotted a two-dimensional representation using a TC plot of the outputs of those, those filters. Uh, and then the colors in these plots correspond to the true values of the forces according to DFT. Um, so this plot alone is very interesting because you can see that the latent space has organized itself in a very clean manner where there's a nice gradient from low to high forces. Um, but you can't really get much more information out of that. Um, you can't answer questions like, what are these configurations that have you know high or low um, energies? But if you have a shared latent space and then you're use, you combine that with other data sets or other models, you can start to understand that, that latent space a lot more. Um, so again, this is a plot of that high dimensional space generated by um, processing the local environments using the filters. Um, but now we're combining it with some of the original data sets that I was showing. Uh, what's really cool here is that now you can see there are regions where, for example, these are the samples that are generated from the germanium data set. So they would correspond to things like diamond crystal structures, um, whereas the copper is now a lot of FCC and BCC is over here with the molybdenum. Um, so because we have this shared latent space, we're able to learn a lot more about um, how our models are working. Um, more than we would have been able to learn um, with just the, the single data set or the single model. But I thought for the splines, you were still using your original spline mean model, right, to fit those. So right, the spline filters. You're still using the spline filters, um, but you can think. And that... those were when I, I thought those were element dependent. That was the whole point, right? That the so... aluminium is going to get a different spline than a copper. So now processing the copper system, I guess I'm missing something. How can I how can I imagine that I can process the copper system when my splines give me the pairwise interaction of an aluminum? Yeah, so I, I don't think you're make, you're missing anything. You're you're correct, is that um, if you just train them as separate models, then they are model specific. But my point is that since the inputs to these splines are just pair distances um, and angles you could force them to use the exact same ones. Um, I, I guess you, that, I, I guess what can you give me an intuition of how you guys thought about that? Because it seems like so now the input to your neural network aspect is kind of funky, right? Because you are using a spline that was trained to represent pairwise potential of aluminum, mm -hmm. but you're now using it on copper. So you're getting a spline that is in some sense, fundamentally not, not the right thing, right? Yeah, so the way that I like to think about it is I like to consider what kind of information is being learned at each layer of the model. Um, so we know that we start off uh, with just a geometry. So it's pure geometric information at the very top. Um, and we know that at the very bottom, it has to have been converted into pure energy information since it's outputting energies. Um, but along the ways, we're taking this environment and transforming it into what eventually becomes an energy. Um, so we could think of this first layer 
as just a lower dimensional representation of the geometry, not necessarily of any energetics. Um, so for example, let's say you had a given crystal structure. So you, you know, you had, let's say an FCC crystal. Um, and I didn't tell you what the elemental types were on it. Um, you could still come up with some representation of that crystal structure and embed it into this eight dimensional space. And then I could tell you, okay, now they're aluminum uh, atoms. And then you could use the bottom half of this network to map from that geometry space into an aluminum energy. Um, and then if I changed it and said some molybdenum energy, now the bottom half is learning the molybdenum energetics. Um, so uh, I guess that's the critical part is that the purpose of the transfer learning is to try to get that separation of information where part of your model is only looking at geometry information, but the other part is actually learning that energetics information. So if I understand correctly, you're essentially always learning aluminum atoms, and then the next step, you're learning the difference between the aluminum atom and whatever molybdenum atom that you want to really represent. I think that's a, a reasonable way to think about it. Um, you could also think about it where, let's say you just take this aluminum data set and you ignore the atomic types on it. Um, you could say that the first thing you're learning is filters that can just tell the difference between different geometries. And then you're learning using these different geometries. I'm going to take these separate models and learn the energetics of those geometries. Okay. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great questions. Um, yeah, and then just to drive the point home, if you used, if you didn't have this shared filters um, for map for interpreting these geometries, now the latent spaces that you're generating in your model are completely different, and you can't get any meaning when you're comparing between the two. So, so there's no information that you'll be able to gain about them relative to each other. Um, so, have, doing this transfer learning is extremely valuable. Um, other things you can do. So, let's say that again, you've taken they're taking the exact same filters. But now you propagate them one through the aluminum network and one through the molybdenum network to see how those same geometries will change um, into an energy. Um, so here's the same energetics we saw previously. But now when you check the energetics of these different systems, you start to be able to see how they're similar or different. Um, for example, they all kind of have this cluster around maybe 45 degrees, um, but some things like the germanium and molybdenum are identifying other low energy low energy bond angles. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, this kind of comes at a cost, though. So I said that we're forcing the molybdenum network to use the same spline filters as the aluminum network. Um, Another thing, if you don't force it, use the exact same ones, what you can see is that the training errors will actually go down. So it's able to specialize a little bit more to the specific molybdenum data set um, and get lower errors. So it's again that same kind of trade off where by forcing them to have that transferability, um, we gain a lot of interpretability, but su we could suffer in accuracy. Uh, so that's kind of some key points here that we can use to answer this question is, um, um, you know, the, this fact that transfer, transferability is so helpful, uh, but comes at a bit of a cost. The final question I wanted to answer is when, how we could design the models in a way that it could tell us when it's, we can trust its predictions. Um, one way we can do that is by using what's called a, a supervised autoencoder. Um, an autoencoder in general, the way that it works is you take your inputs, you transform it and map it down into a latent space, and then you have a decoder that will take that latent space representation and try and decode it back out into the original representation. Um, so now your model will not only be, be trying to predict energies and forces, but it'll also have a term in the loss function for measuring how good it is at reproducing its original inputs. The idea here is that your latent space representation, if your decoder is able to decode things back out, is basically creating a, as little information loss as possible in a lower dimensionality space. Um, the benefit here is that if your decoder is not doing well at reproducing a given environment, that tells you that um, there was in some information being lost for that given environment, 
And it might be able to warn you that since there's information loss, the resultant ener energy predictions from that reduced representation might also be problematic. Um, oops. You can also extend that to what's called a variation, supervised variational autoencoder, where now instead of embedding the point in, as a, embedding each input as a point in latent space, it embeds it as a uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution with a given mean vector and variance matrix, covariance matrix. Um, and now there's an additional term that pushes these these variances to be as small as possible. Um, I think this is obviously a very fast uh, introduction to supervised variational autoencoders, and it'll be very confusing, especially if you haven't seen autoencoders before. Um, but the critical idea here to keep in mind is that the variance can be used as a measure of how much noise there is around that given point, um, or kind of about how much possible information, how, much, how possible it is that there's information being lost. Um, so what you can do is you can take the means and the variances of these embedded points and plot them on the polar plots like we did previously. Um, so this top row here is still just the energetics that I showed on a previous slide. But the bottom row here is the polar plots um, where the color represents the magnitude of that variance vector in the latent space. Again, um, you don't necessarily need to worry too much about the details of a variational autoencoder, um, as long as you can keep in mind that a high variance means that there's information being lost in those regions. So what we see here is that even though each of these models starts off with um, a same the same spline filters, um, based upon the energetics of those systems, they are kind of losing different information in different regions uh, of the spaces. Um, so in the aluminum space, it could be here in this bubble um, or, or various other things for copper, molybdenum, or uh, germanium. Um, so that's kind of at least a partial answer to this last question. I don't think this anyone would call this full uncertainty quantification, um, but it can at least be kind of like a warning flag in your model that as you're running your simulation, it could be telling you you're sampling a lot of regions where I'm losing information, and therefore you might not be able to trust the predictions that the model is making. Um, I'm also at the end. Uh, we'll just the last thing I want to do is just kind of brainstorm things of how you or ways that you could use this type of information of your about your model. Um, and this is really just kind of other research directions that either I'd like to go in or I'd like to see other people go in. Um, first is to see someone actually run simulations using these models um, and start to use these ways of visualizing the environments in order to learn structure property relations for their given application. Second, you could use the variational autoencoder for data set generation. So I said that the Los Alamos group was using an uncertainty metric based on an ensemble um, predictions, but your variational autoencoder can use a single model uh, rather than an ensemble of models to make a prediction about how far outside of the training set you are. Um, so you could use this, this VAE for doing your data set generation as well in a faster manner. The stuff that I think would be coolest is more analysis of these these latent spaces that are common when you when you force them to be common between different systems. Uh, so doing things like transfer learning the spline filters to dozens and dozens of different elemental or alloy, alloy systems, and then see how those models perform relative to each other, um, and to understand the space better. Um, you could also do things like using the variational autoencoders as generative models like they're supposed to be used. Um, this is already commonly used for molecules where uh, you can resample this latent space and decode them back out into uh, new configurations. Um, the problem, this hasn't been applied to bulk periodic crystals because the descriptors aren't invert invertible, so you can't turn the descriptor all the way back out into atomic coordinates. But if someone ever comes up with a good way of doing that, then it'll be a really cool way of generating new data. Um, also, I'd love to see how you compare different models blind spots for different models on the same data. Uh, because if you take these latent space visualizations and you plot where the blind spots are on each of them, then if you do use multiple different models, you might see where one model might be better than another model or might be worse than another model, uh, which is very interesting. Other cool stuff would be exploring transition pathways in these latent space and comparing them to transitions in real space. For example, if you were trying to look at 
migration barrier, like vacancy migration barriers in some system, um, you could check to see what kinds of environments are being sampled in the latent space because maybe they're so connected that it just looks like they're following a curve in latent space, which means that you could perform analysis in the latent space as well as real space, which would be very cool. Um, the last thing um, is uh, all of these ideas that I threw out heavily rely upon data. Um, so you need large databases of material properties. Um, there are already a few things like this. So things like materials project are very familiar to material scientists, OQMD, AFLOLIB, DP library. Uh, the problem is that none of these databases have the kind of data that you would need for training the models that I've been talking about. Um, usually they only have um, uh, ground state configurations or minimized stru uh, relaxed structures. Um, but for fitting a potential, as you know, people have pointed out, you want your training data to be very, very diverse. You want to make sure that it's transferable to many different um, um, volumes or pressures or whatever you have. Um, so you need you need something more complex than what's in a lot of these databases. Uh, the places that you can get the type of, type of data that I'm talking about would be cases like where authors of of model developers are publishing their data sets. So things like those single element data sets that I used where they published them on GitHub or upload them to Figshare or happen to be responsive to email. Um, those are also good places, but they have their own problems in that usually each author is um, formatting their data in different ways. So you have to dealing with converting data every time you get new stuff. Uh, it might be missing important metadata that you need for understanding it, or it might just be impossible to get because they don't respond or they, you know, they don't publish it in any way. Um, so that motivates um, uh, some previous work that I, is a collaboration that I started with a group at the University of Minnesota and New York University for building a database specifically for storing data sets for training in atomic potentials. Um, so this group, they're still working on getting the website up and running, um, but they're very open to collaborations. And if you're interested either in the data that they're working with, or if you have your own data to contribute, uh, you can contact them um, at this website or let me know and I can get you in touch with them as well. Uh, with that, I will end my talk here on this slide. Thank you again um, for inviting me here to speak. It's really great honor to get to talk um, because I really respect a lot of the work that Los Lawrence Livermore does. Um, and I had a lot of fun um, with the questions and discussions today. Um, with that, if there's Thanks any a lot, other questions. Josh. Um, so be before, uh, we'll probably have time for, for a question or two, but before opening up for that, I wanted to let everybody on the call know that, um, Josh is looking for an internship actually this fall. So if after, you know, hear, hearing this talk, you, you have identified that your project could use someone like Josh. Um, if you would reach out to me, I would love to connect you, um, with Josh. Um, so. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or or come off of mute and ask those. If you also happen to come up with questions in the future, you can just email me um, if you have more things you want to ask about. Well, one question, it's Sebastian again. I'm sorry, I'm always the one asking. But, no, uh, thank you. The uh, one thing that continues to trip us up when we try to do these uh, fitting is having very high energy regions in the potential energy surface and very, also very small energies. Mm -hmm. and then it's a question of signal to noise, right? It's it's difference of large numbers overshadowing important parts of the space where you want the fitting to be accurate. Um, right. How, do you have any thoughts on getting around this? It seems like something that math people should have figured out a long time ago, and I'm just maybe not aware. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll blame those math people, um, but, um, I think it's really a big question about data set generation, um, because you're right that, you know, if I have forces that are 10 times bigger than some other forces, I would either need to be having some way of weighting them properly, or I should have those smaller force environments be 10 times as likely to be present in my data set. Um, so I, I think it comes in, down to data set generation, because if you have a method that can, um, either uniformly sample across all of your different environments that you're interested in, or um, 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 
preferentially sample the specific regions that you're interested in, then that's how you're going to be able to make sure that your model um, isn't being swamped out um, by specific spe specific portions of your data. Um, beyond that, you're going to have to either just change your loss function, change your weighting, um, or find some kind of regularization that you can do that forces it to prefer certain environments. All right, well, I think this is a good um, place to wrap up at the end of the hour here. Again, Josh, thanks for the very informative and engaging talk. I, I definitely think you were a, a great choice for us to um, bring in as a representative of the Digimap program. Um, I just very quickly, I wanted to advertise that next week we're going to be having a smaller group discussion with the director of the Digimap program, which is this graduate program at UIUC that Josh is a part of. And I think this is a really great opportunity for LNL to sharpen our our connections to the material science and data science efforts that are happening um, at UIUC, specifically connecting to the, the student population there. So if you're interested in joining that conversation, please let me know and I will add you to the invite. Um, so thanks everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll see you for our seminar next month.